We are truly blessed to have Josh. Welcome. Glad that you all could be here this morning. It's not as hot as it has been, but it's there. We have AC. Amen. And we have a bell ringer this week. It's awesome. Not that last week's bad bell ringer was not. It's just, there's a rhythm to it. It's it's like a dance. There's only a couple of people that I know here in the church that can do the dance, and Boyd is one of them. <laughs> He's what? What? What is he saying? Uh, let's talk about what's happening this week. First of all, uh, Zoom check-in is on our regular time at 1 o'clock on Tuesday. And we have elders meeting on Tuesday night, and we're continuing our study. Uh, music jam is at 11 o'clock on Thursday. We had four people jamming here on Thursday, upon, and, and I've sorted the music. We had just the whole, it looked like a bomb went off up here with all these papers all over but I've organized those, and so we're starting to come together. We're starting to look at some songs that we can do. If you want to come and make a joyful noise to the Lord, Thursday at 11 o'clock right here. And also on Friday, July 23rd, uh, the Healing Circle will be meeting at, uh, room, in room 6, and they will be um, meeting from 1 till 3. So if you have any questions about what the Healing Circle is, Judy Brillhart can probably answer those questions. Are there any other announcements? Okay. If there are none, then our opening hymn today is Majesty. morning everyone oh, oh that was lively <laughs> thank you Margaret <laughs> our call to worship it's up there and do this with enthusiasm because there's a lot of exclamation points at the end of this the earth is the Lord's everything in creation belongs to God the 
This is the Lord's house, and who hope in, all who hope in the Lord will be called children of God. This is the hour for worship and song. Praise the Lord with all your might. Thanks be to God. Do we have any children here today? Any? You are a kid at heart. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll have an adults moment this morning because this, this is, uh, so I, I've got a question for you. Does anybody know why when you go into a church there's usually arched ceilings in there? Ken? I never heard that one, but that's that's okay. It, just, it sounds great. It looks like it. Oh my gosh, it does. Now I'm never going to unsee that, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Sacred architecture is is really interesting because uh, over the years in the church, we have the the eye wants to draw upwards. The eye wants to follow uh, follow lines, especially if they're going up. And so these 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 walls, these ceilings, are pointing to God. And if you look at uh, different designs of different churches, there's almost always uh, an upward movement as far as the architecture goes. Not all, not all but some, and that's the fun thing about how we build our churches because there are, you know what, I bet, I bet you there is somebody who said, oh, this looks kind of like an ark too, and that's okay because, you know, we'll run around and bleat like goats and oink like pigs and just have a good old time. But um, it's kind of neat that everything kind of has a meaning, doesn't it? And so even the buildings that we build uh, are monuments and uh, so our appreciation for God. So that's pretty cool, I think. So there, there's your adult moment. Mary. There we go. That's that's a very good engineering observation too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bless you for not giving me all sorts of funky Hebrew this time. All right. <clears throat> One more semester of Hebrew, and what does he do to me? I get all the funky Hebrew stuff. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. This is the NRSV version. Now, when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more and evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. 
and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by a human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every disciple congregation that I've ever worked in, and I'm talking going all the way back to uh, college days, has been about the same size. Now, mind you, I've I've only actually served four congregations uh, since I started, so um, you know that that's the way that goes. But they've all been roughly the same size, or at least according to the classifications that most church growth experts use. So outside of my occasional venture into a wannabe megachurch in Eugene, Oregon, I've really not had that much experience in large churches. And I always forget sometimes that there are pastors out there who haven't spent any time in small churches. So about nine years or so ago, I uh, traveled up to Eugene, Oregon, to have a reunion with a group of people from my old high school Campus Life group. And Campus Life is, a, is an organization uh, that's a Christian organization on campus, on high school campuses, and they're the ones who helped me come to faith. And so I was up there visiting uh, with some friends, and one of them had gone into the ministry. Actually, a lot of them had gone into the ministry, but I was speaking to one in particular who'd gone into a, a ministry and he was having some frustrations with his senior pastor and he said to the senior pastor he said that the senior pastor was trying to develop a program that just wasn't working out in the church and he said I keep telling him you can get away with that in a church of a thousand but you're not going to get away with that in a church of only 300 now I get what he was trying to say I get what he was trying to say because for sure Churches of different sizes require different programming. I get that. But this little voice in my head was saying, only 300? He's working in a church that's three to four times bigger than any church that I've worked in, and he's talking only 300. Now, I don't think he was wishing that he was in a a thousand member church I honestly don't think that but I got to say there was a part of me that was thinking man I wish I had a 300 member church but then I caught myself because I've often been critical of pastors and churches that are obsessed with numbers and the sizes of their buildings and things like that so I know I've probably told this story before but it's bears repeating because it illustrates what I'm trying to say here Uh, back when I first moved to Chico, I was invited to a gathering of Stone Campbell churches over in Orland, uh, and they met on the second Wednesday of the month. And I thought, that's okay. I've done that before. And so I go over, and uh, here I am, the, the lone disciple in a room of mostly independent Christian church sem- uh, churches. And that's okay because I went to an independent Christian church seminary. So I get it. I get it. Nothing against them. But I forget how absolutely obsessed with numbers most of them can be. So um, everyone, everyone that I met at that meeting introduced themselves by stating their name, their congregation, and their average worship attendance. I kid you not, I don't make this stuff up. 
And after a while, it started seeming like a joke. I mean, every time it would happen, I'd be like, you know, just trying to hold it in. You know, I was doing great until an individual came and introduced himself to me. And he set himself up for a potential Jesse Kern smart aleck response. <laughs> you know how hard it is for me to, to pass those up. So he comes up to me, introduces me, introduces himself, introduces his congregation, and tells me what his uh, average worship attendance is. And I said, oh, okay, I'm uh, Jesse Kearns, and I am the first uh, pastor at the First Christian Church in Chico. <laughs> and he said, and I quote, Oh, how big are you? <laughs> so when this little angel came down, landed on my shoulder and said, Don't do it, Jesse. Don't do it. Because whatever comes out of your mouth right now, if that's what you're if it's what you're thinking, you're going to regret it. A little devil comes down. A lights on my shoulder and said, you're not going to let that one pass, are you? <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> and so I said, I'm about 5'10", maybe 220, depending on what I've had <laughs> night before for dinner. <laughs> A couple of weeks later, Tom Shiflett told me about the Chico Area Interfaith Council that also meets on second Wednesdays of the month. I've been with them ever since, and I've served Four terms on their executive council, too. So they appreciate my sense of humor is what I'm trying to say. Let's, let's face it. Pastors who build bigger buildings to accommodate their ever-expanding congregations are going to be seen as more successful than the ones who do not. And the thing is, is I may not believe this lie in my head, but there's something in my gut that just it bothers me in kind of a bad way, too. Uh, I am now closer to retirement than I was when I first started ministry. In other words, I've got, I've got more years behind me than I do ahead of me in ministry. And it's almost inevitable that leaders who are in my station uh, of the journey of ministry are wondering, at least from time to time, about what sort of legacy that they'll leave behind. You know, what, what sort of monuments will remain to show what they've accomplished? Well, we can see this going on here in the scripture that Mary read uh, this morning from 2 Samuel. Um, this whole story is about King David's desire to build a huge and impressive temple alongside his already huge and impressive house or his palace. And it sounds like his motives are good, doesn't it? I mean, he's saying, hey, how is it that I can be living in this huge opulent house while the Lord, the God of Israel, is still housed in a tent? That doesn't seem right. But, but that tent was no ordinary tent, right? Ah. Uh, it was the tabernacle, and it served them as a mobile temple that carried the what? Da, 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 da. Yep, carried the Ark of the Covenant. And as we said last week, it was a pretty impressive structure uh, in itself. But now that it was standing alongside all these increasingly uh, great and wonderful buildings, all of a sudden, David said, you know, this is looking a little rustic here. We need to change this. And, you know, when the king's looking to build impressive structures to further solidify uh, his, his power and prestige, uh, you know, and this is, this is to the God who's going to guarantee that continued impressive regime and things like that, then, you know, of course, building a temple is going to be high on his list of priorities. So David called in his prophet, Nathan. And he told Nathan about these plans to build a temple. And at first, Nathan said, yeah, no, that sounds like a good idea, David. Because, you know, if the man in charge wants to build a building that looks good for religion, 
why not? Let's do it. It must be a good thing. Or is it? Well, that night, God spoke to Nathan, kind of took Nathan aside a little bit and says, okay, um, this isn't a good thing. You are not going to build a temple. And that kind of went against what Nathan was thinking before, and so he thought, wow, now I'm going to have to go tell David this. Okay, so Nathan went to David, and he said, okay, David, last night I had... A conversation with God and here's what God said God said tell David no you are not the one to build me a temple don't get me wrong I am still backing you as king of Israel but I don't want you to build me a house because I am quite happy with this tent that you've given me thank you very much for the time being okay so let's take a break here and look at the difference between a portable tent and a permanent stone temple, at least as far as their value goes for being a, a symbol of God's presence, okay? The whole point of the tent was its portability. The people were on the move uh, from Egypt to the Promised Land, and wherever they went, God was there in their midst. But what happens when you settle down a little more permanently? What happens when you don't have to be mobile anymore? Do you build a permanent home for God, too? Well, you start to think uh, that that's a good idea. But then when you build it, you start realizing um, that, or at least in your minds, well, this temple is... God's temple. It's God's place, just like it says down in our basement door. There's God's place and there's Kay's place. We're talking <laughs> God's place. Which means, if you see this as only God's place, what you do is you start seeing other places as not God's place. You start, in fact, even seeing or, or saying that there's an absence of God in some place. And then... Then you start to think uh, that God's attention is focused on the people of this place and everybody else is just aliens. And then you begin to think of the temple as a guarantee of God's presence and protection no matter what kind of a bonehead decision your rulers make because you've strayed so far from God. You know, this, this is God's place. We are guaranteed God's protection no matter what. And then maybe, just maybe, the very architecture of the building that you build reflects your beliefs about who really matters to God and who doesn't. Who's in? Who's out? Maybe you might have walls in your structure that only the high priest could pass through, or maybe walls that only Israelite men could pass through, or walls that made sure that women and children and Gentiles uh, knew their place and thus their distance from God. And here's a spoiler alert. This is, this is getting ahead a little bit. David's son Solomon will build a temple like this. By then, though, the people were so thoroughly used to thinking that God only resided in the temple that when they were dragged off into captivity into Babylon, they sang songs like this. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, a land where the Lord does not live? Because for them, it was, it was clear that God, the God who would gladly live in a traveling tent, had long been forgotten, if that's the way they were thinking. So, in light of that history, maybe we can speculate that when powerful religious men want to build grand temples, not only are they building something to be remembered by themselves, but they are building walls that can contain and monopolize their God. They are building walls that will declare to all who can see them, this God is our 
God. And that we are God's people and the rest of you are not. We want to claim God. We want to own God. We want to use God to secure our own status and privilege as God's beloved, righteous, and saved people. Which is very interesting if we come back to my opening comments about uh, big churches and ambitious pastors who uh, like to launch big temple building projects like the ancient kings. See, conventional church growth wisdom says that churches grow faster only when you make it clear about who is in and who is out. Let me say that again in case you think, what, what did you say? Conventional church growth wisdom says that churches grow faster only when you make it clear about who is in and who is out. That's what happens when the in-group is recognizably similar to one another and thus they feel comfortable and at home with each other. So if you want to grow a large church in a short amount of time, you don't go for this diversity stuff. You don't target diversity. You go after a specific demographic group. And furthermore, you strengthen, you strengthen the identity of that group, that in-group, by uniting them in a hostile rejection of others, of those deemed to be evil or lost or aliens or strangers with no hope of never knowing God in the world. And if that's the way we are, then we are in serious danger of rebuilding exactly the wrong kind of temple, uh, the, the wrong kind of walls, the very walls that Jesus poured his life out to take down. So if you've, already, if you've always seen yourself as one of the privileged insiders, this is not good news. You know, things change when folks see that they're welcome on the inside of God's beloved temple. Things change when folks realize that because of Jesus, you don't get to hold exclusive privilege anymore. That privilege is one you now share with all manner of aliens and strangers and undesirables. You are no longer the insider. Bad news, huh? if you're an insider. See, if you were one who has been made to feel like an outsider all your life, this is amazing news. If you've ever been as defined as unacceptable or unwelcome, this is also very good news. Because if someone has ever used the Bible or religious tradition to prove that you are uh, excluded on the grounds of your race or nationality or gender or sexuality or personal history or social background or where you are on the social ladder, uh, whether you're biblical, literate or not, it, you know, it's whatever, then if that's the case, this is good news, really good news. In Christ, that veil of the temple has been torn down. That dividing wall has been broken down and you are now being securely built with everyone else into the gracious love of God. Now sure, in practice, this can be uncomfortable. It can be frustrating sometimes because our, our little congregation here are I'm not even, no, I'm not even going to say it. We're, we're big, right? Because we got big hearts and we do big things in this community. But our little congregation here is uh, as good of illustration as any because we are kind of an odd assortment of um, folks who maybe wouldn't naturally gravitate to one another if we were just looking for an easy, comfortable friendships and things like that with like-minded people. But comfortable friendships with our own kind is not what the church is called to be. 
Uh, we're, we are called to be the little bitty seeds for the emerging reign of God, a culture of radical reconciliation where we learn to love and care for one another across every boundary that might previously have divided us. And with the boundaries crossed and the dividing walls pulled down and the, the big people church uh, or the big church people and, and all the alienated and the unclean and the powerful kings and, and everyone gathered into one great temple of God's love and grace. And there it is. That's the kind of house. This is the kind of house that God is delighted to dwell in. Our hymn of invitation this morning is, O God of Every Nation. It's a song about our uh, call as the church to proclaim good news to everyone. There are no outsiders or insiders. We are all created in the image of God. And when you consider that there are no two people of like, that is, that's a big thing. So if you have ever, uh, have you, if you have been on a journey and your journey has led you to faith, uh, if you've never had the opportunity to uh, confess a faith in Christ, this is a time that you can do that. If, you've, if you don't have a church family that you can call your own and you would like First Christian Church, our beautiful look up to God but look down from the ark uh, sort of thing, we would love to have you uh, because there is a place here for you. You are welcome. All are welcome at this table. So if that is the case, uh, we'd like you to come forward during our song, O God of Every Nation. phone call excuse me got up first of all it was a text message this week it was addressed to Janice McAllister the pastor of the First Christian Church in Paradise and uh, here at First Christian Church and the the message was is are you okay are there any disciple churches who are in need of anything. We, we hear that there's va evacuations going on and communities in danger. Is there any disciple presence there? And is there any way we can help? Take a wild guess who that was that made, asked that question. Hmm? Yes, and what does he represent? 
Week of compassion. There we go. Prize for the lady. <laughs> Week of compassion is probably one of our, uh, I don't want to say it's our most important ministry, but when you are in trouble and when something has blown down, burned down, or floated away, Week of compassion is the people who are right on the spot. Uh, trying to help and so I just wanted to let you know that week of compassion cares for the congregations and wanted to know how we were doing and if there was any way that we could help us help others so week of compassion that's coming up in oh wait we passed that that was back in February January week of compassion is a ministry that you can support all during throughout the year and if you would like to make a donation to Week of Compassion, make sure that you put that in uh, the two line on the check or the uh, little line on the bottom left corner. I haven't written a check in a long time. I'm sorry. Okay, it is now time for our prayers of the people. Well, good morning and chew gum. Can't move my glasses and use the mic either. Okay, so um, it's that time in our service where we lift up our joys and our concerns, and I always like to lead off with joy because it's always refreshing to hear how God is working in our life and blessing us, and it's refreshing to hear it in the assembly. So what are our joys? Yes, Georgia. right I always forget sorry <laughs> uh, my brother Kevin birthday yesterday which he celebrated in North Carolina with his wonderful family back there and their one-year-old that they haven't seen through all of COVID <laughs> so that was a great great praise all right birthdays, reuniting with family, traveling after the pandemic. These are all joys. What are some other joys? Joy, joy, joy. Joy. Being back in church without a mask. There we go. <laughs> yes, and I look forward to the day when we can sing again and sing loud and proud and do all that kind of stuff. That'll be wonderful. Okay, so um, we have a list of concerns, and um, I'm going to go ahead and start with those, and then I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, Wanda Story is undergoing treatment for an aneurysm. We got a notification, was it Friday? I think yeah, it was Friday. Friday. Yeah. And she was in the hospital, and Jesse went over to visit her, and um, yeah, so she is going to have a, a test tomorrow, and she's asking for our prayers and our support. Um, and so we are lifting up Wanda and her family and praying for the absolute best outcomes for her health and family. Lord, hear our prayers. Um, Ann Nelson has a cousin who lives in Red Bluff, and this cousin died Wednesday from COVID, the Delta variant. So um, just a reminder that we, you know, still need to be diligent. You know, if you're vaccinated, that's good, but uh, wear your mask in situations where you're not really sure. But we are lifting up Anne's family and pray that God's grace and mercy and comfort will be with them. Lord. Hear our prayers. Anything in Facebook land? Mm, no. Nope. But Zoom land, he might be able to tell you Zoom? if there's anything in Zoom Nope. Land. Okay. And then it was just uh, Jill uh, saying, uh, uh, getting the request that Ann had already made. So. Okay. All right. All right. So what are the concerns you guys have? What are some things we need to lift up to the Lord and ask for wisdom, mercy, healing? What's going on? Yes. Just protection for all the firefighters out there fighting all the fires that we have in California and other states. And not only the firefighters, but all the pilots that fly. You've heard all the 
planes going over, the tankers and the helicopters. And so just continued prayers for, um, pray that they get those fires out. Pray that uh, protection for the people who are fighting them and for the pilots who are flying in pretty dangerous conditions to help put those fires out. So, Lord. Yeah. All right. Oh, <laughs> everyone on the same page there. So, okay. Yes. So I had the opportunity to be able to um, spend some time with Janet, um, Nina Jones's daughter, yesterday. So that was a joy, but um, her sister, Karen, is now moving from Colorado to um, Illinois. And just prayers that everything goes smoothly with her and as she moves closer to her daughters. And uh, so that's, that's also a joy that she's being able to do that. But, um, you know, moving, especially state to state, is going to be very challenging for her. So um, good thoughts for her and that it all goes well. Lifting up Karen Morak as she relocates from Colorado to Illinois. For those who don't know, Karen is Nina's daughter and one of our own. Lord. Okay. Anything else? Whoa. Hi. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and take a moment and uh, settle our heart and mind and get comfortable. For those of you who are new here, uh, we also do kind of a breathing technique to uh, get our minds settled before we start praying. So I ask that you sit up straight in your pew, feet on the floor, back's really straight. You know, and sometimes I just, oh, roll my neck a little bit. Uh, that feels so good. And then our hands are out to receive from the Holy Spirit, and together we breathe in one deep cleansing breath. In the peace of our hearts and the silence of our mind, this is when God speaks. We are so grateful to be able to come to a sanctuary together again and worship you, O oh God. Thank you. We are grateful, O oh God, for the many blessings, whether they be little acts of gratitude or moments of wisdom when we didn't know what to do and all of a sudden we did for being reunited with family, for being in the hospital and getting treatment, for getting out of the hospital because you're done with treatment. There are so many things to give thanks and praise, oh God, and we do this for you. Let's take another deep cleansing breath. Oh, Heavenly Father, as our world is changing, and we are in times that it seems so fraught with despair. Fires are burning. People are needing to relocate. People are having to evacuate. People are frightened because there are new things going on with their body and they don't know what to do. People are having to move to be closer to family. And so, Lord, in these times of uncertainty, let us remember the story from the scripture we read and the sermon that Jesse preached. God, you are not contained in any building. You are not pinned down to the Holy Bible. You are everywhere, and you always go before us. You are there, making a way in times and places when we thought there was no way. Thank you, O oh God for leading us and loving us. Thank you, O oh God, for reminding us that you are not stagnant, but always moving, always there, always comforting, always. O oh Lord, for the unspoken request today, the one that might have been a little too personal to bring up in the assembly, we ask, O oh God, 
that your mercy and grace and healing be upon that as well. And Father, a special prayer and blessing for firefighters and all the personnel involved fighting these fires, our pilots, even prisoners who are out on the front lines of this fire, making it safe for everyone else. Protect them, O oh God. Grant them peace, grant them rest, grant them protection in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we'll go ahead and close this prayer with the prayer your son, Jesus, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen our uh, hymn of communion this morning is here is bread uh, you can find that in your purple books on 161 or in your bulletin if you uh, chose to print one out or grab one this morning. This week I was doing a little bit of reading and found a passage by Henry Nguyen, who is one of my favorite theologians, and it ties pretty much into what Jesse was talking about this morning. There are many forms of poverty, economic poverty, physical poverty, emotional poverty, mental poverty, and spiritual poverty. As long as we relate primarily to each other's wealth, health, stability, intelligence, and soul strength, we cannot develop the community. A community is not a talent show in which we dazzle the world with our combined gifts. A community is a place where our poverty is acknowledged and accepted, not as something we have to learn to cope with as best as we can, but as a true source of new life. Living community is, in whatever form, family, parish, 12-step program, or intentional community challenges us to come together at the place of our poverty, believing that there we can reveal our richness. Our richness. 
so Jesus invites us to this table as we are in our poverty with each other. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take this, need this in remembrance of me. This is broken for you. And he also took the cup and he blessed it and he said, take and drink of this. This is my blood that is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Holy, loving God, forgive us when we feel, fail to see one another's gifts, when we see only others' faults, their weaknesses. You welcome each of us as we are, meeting us at our most damaged places, loving our deepest wounds. You urge us towards wholeness, with each other, with you, in you. Amen. Together we take the symbol of God's, uh, Christ's body broken for us and the cup uh, of the new covenant. Would you stand with me for our benediction? As you go home today to your palaces, uh, remember that the church is not just the building. The church, most importantly, is the people. And we, the people of God, have good news to bring in the world. Go deliver it. Amen.